Ta-da! Text-based intro. Hello, my name is Muse and Lestrala, and I've been an avid uh, video gamer for more than 30 years, a musician for more than 30 years, uh, a composer for 14, a game developer for nearly three. I'm the executive director and lead composer at Queenship Game Studio, a woman-owned and operated game studio making games about mental health, social interaction, and relationship building. In addition to several other music projects, I am the director of Geek Musica, which is a classical ensemble that performs video game and film scores, most of which I arrange. Um, my time with Geek Musica was actually what led me to a new path in my music career, video game composition. Did anyone who knew me as a child really think I'd grow up to be a classical musician, an ensemble director, a video game composer? Probably not. Um, I think the reason why is fairly obvious. When I started Geek Musica, I had very little support, even from friends. When I talked about wanting to be a game developer and composer, uh, same deal. Not one person expressed confidence that I could do it. The color of my skin, in addition to being female presenting, has had a significant impact on the perception of other people where my abilities, intelligence, and drive are concerned. And it is no different from other people of color, other women, and other LGBTQA community members. I'll be blunt. I'm not here today to talk about the moral mandate of inclusivity, nor what a moralistic framework for this concept might look like. I take these things as a given, that it is morally correct to include others and to work to dismantle bigotry, bigotry sorry, in all its stripes. I'm here to talk about the tangible benefits of inclusivity, for there are many, and to perhaps spark some ideas on how to argue for inclusivity on that basis, not purely based on the premise that it is the morally right path to pursue, even though it is. If you, I guess as the saying goes, uh, if you are asked a question in French, you must answer in French. And as loath as I am to admit this, some people will not connect with inclusivity as a moral framework. And so it seems practical, and I am a pragmatist, to be able to couch it in uh, other frameworks as well as a moralistic one. In other words, sometimes you have to be able to convince someone to do the right thing for perhaps not the entirely right reasons. Non-inclusive workplaces, scandal, sorrow, and suffering. So let's have a look at a little bit of data. I selected some data that's sort of pertinent to my own uh, professions here. So this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The BLS tends to prioritize categorizing job function over industry, but you kind of get the idea. When it comes to creative or what is sometimes referred to as soft skill work, and I'm using air quotes here, such as writing and art, you see a great deal of women working in those industries, even though those fields are still overwhelmingly white. But when you examine music as a field, as well as programming, this is really, really, where you start to see an overwhelmingly white and male representation of people working in those fields. In the UK, just 4% of game designers are of Black or Asian descent. In a survey that the IGDA did earlier uh, last year, they interviewed around 1,000 people working in game development. 74% were cis males, 61% were white, 81% were heterosexual. 1% identified as Black, 4% identified as Hispanic or Latina, 23% identified as female, 5% identified as trans or non-binary, 19% identified as non-heterosexual, so bi, pan, or homosexual. If we compare these numbers to the demographics of people who actually play video games, we see a very different picture. Here's a handful of statistics. In the U.S., 41% of gamers identify as women. 75% of African Americans identify as gamers compared with the national average of 66%. 66% of Latina teens play video games, to name a few. Since so many POC and women play video games, it stands to reason that these groups should be much more represented in game development. So why aren't they? To start with, there are significant gaps in STEM and game development education for women and POC versus white men. Some of these gaps are due to 
misallocated resources in the public school system because school funding in the U.S. is based on property tax and as a result, poor people don't receive as high quality in education because their schools get less funding. In the U.S., POC are at least twice as likely to live in poverty as white citizens, 23% for Hispanic and Latina residents, 26% for Black residents, 28% for Indigenous residents. Even for people of color and women that do attend a good public or private school, they are often warned away from STEM and game development due to problematic and racist attitudes among educational professionals and even guidance counselors. POC and women college students may also run into a brick wall when working towards their professional goals. At worst, they may even face sabotage of those goals from educators, a surprisingly common, though little reported, problem. Finally, some people of color may face familial or cultural resistance to their goals if they express interest in certain fields. In some POC communities, the idea of education, particularly in specific fields like game development, carries an association of quote unquote whiteness. This is not true, of course, but this attitude can and does have a tremendous impact on young POC, although its influence is fading as more and more POC, especially African American women, are going to college and university and completing degrees in a broad variety of fields. The benefits of an equal society. The most important thing to understand is that equality benefits everyone not just the oppressed or the underprivileged. Some of the benefits of an equal society include fewer health and social problems, child welfare is better in wealthy countries with equality, levels of trust are overall higher societally, reducing anxiety, infant mortality rates are lower, homicide rates are lower, teen pregnancy rates are lower, there's less conflict between children, particularly in schools. The rates of imprisonment are lower. Mental health problems are lower. Life expectancy is longer. Inequalities create enormous stress for everyone, not just for the underdogs, but for the privileged as well. When societies are more equal, everyone reaps these benefits. Inclusive workplaces, profit and positivity. Inclusive workplaces demonstrate similar benefits as they reflect the values and practices of an equal society. Companies with more gender diversity are more than 20% more likely to enjoy above average profits. Companies with more ethnic diversity do even better. More than 30% more likely to enjoy higher profits. Why? A company that prioritizes diversity automatically opens itself up to a much larger pool of candidates a wider range of skills and cultural insights, and as a result can recruit top talent much more easily than a company that doesn't. What's more, those same companies tend to be kinder to the well-being of their workers, both in company culture and as a result of employee engagement. This translates to lower employee turnover, better employee production. Happy employees stay at their jobs and they're more effective at their work. Diverse companies tend to have a higher employee happiness and job satisfaction rate. This cuts down significantly on the amount of money they have to spend for talent recruitment, and they won't have to spend it as often. Finally, companies that prioritize diversity and inclusion simply have better reputations than ones that don't. Those companies will enjoy a greater ease of product to market process and larger investments generally. They'll have fewer public relations disasters. And it goes without saying that these companies will be sued far less, if at all, for discrimination, harassment, abuse, or assault. Some studios and game industry organizations are known for making inclusivity a priority and leading the call to creating a more inclusive games industry. Square Enix, uh, UKIE, Sega, Nintendo, Sony Interactive, and Bastion are just a few organizations known for having more positive and inclusive work cultures. Diverse rock stars in gaming. Khalil and Ahmed Abdullah, Decoy Games. These two African-American brothers run Decoy Games and have won awards for their excellence in gaming. Their latest release, Swim Sanity, is a super fun and action-packed underwater shooting game and can be played solo or co-op. Cat Small, game designer and developer. Kat Small is an African-American game designer and developer based in New York City. Her day job is as product designer at Asana, where she creates brilliant solutions for businesses. 
By night, or by spare time, she creates video games. Her latest game is called Sweetheart, a game about microaggressions, race, and gender. She is a well-known and often booked game industry speaker and educator. Arzu Falahi, concept artist. Arzu Falahi is a games industry veteran and creates brilliant concept art for a variety of games. She spent nearly seven years at Vicarious Visions, a subdivision of Activision, and has worked on a number of AAA titles, including Skylanders and Destiny 2. Lisette Titer Montgomery, Art Director, Double Fine Productions. Lisette Titer Montgomery is one of the industry greats. She's worked at EA, Ubisoft, and is now Art Director at Double Fine, a division of Xbox Games. She is a celebrated and storied industry speaker and educator at the national and international levels and has contributed her time and talents to creating and broadcasting opportunities in gaming and tech for women and girls of color. Jamara Kindred, co-founder and art director, Second Dinner. Jamara Kindred has served as a senior concept artist at Nerve and Blizzard. He's worked on Doom 2, Call of Duty Black Ops, Aliens, Colonial Marines, and Hearthstone. Second Dinner is currently working on some Marvel games after raising a tremendous amount of investment. Last but not least, these are some notable platforms you should check out. Black game developers, game dev Latinos, and queers play games. I'm not even going to lie to you. I am way too lazy to make a bibliography. So here are the sources I use to create this presentation. Um, Gama Sutra, Forbes, Kotaku, Women in STEM, Quartz, The Guardian, The Evening Standard, The Independent, Statista, TechCrunch, Pew Research Center, McKinsey and Company, the Tech Valley Game Space, and IGDA. Not gonna lie, it makes me feel incredibly awful that I should have to talk about profitability as a basis for company success, uh, for company diversity, really. But I also know that no matter why a company starts prioritizing inclusivity, that company winds up being transformed from within. Some companies have succeeded in getting rid of problematic people after an inclusivity or a diversity initiative was introduced, even that company's founders. Papa John's, anyone? I nevertheless felt this was an important thing to discuss. As a queer black femme professional, inclusivity initiatives directly benefit me. I work hard to create a work environment that is inclusive and supportive because I know for the right reasons that it will benefit others. But ruling out any discussion of non-moral bases for inclusivity does all of us a disservice, really, uh, privileged and disadvantaged alike. We have to root inclusivity however and wherever we can. And if it comes down to you using whatever privilege you have and saying to your boss, we'll make more money if we diversify our company and that conversation leads to a win for diversity in your company, we all win. Thank you so much for watching. Again, my name is Mios N. Lestrala, and this has been The Pragmatism of Inclusivity. Um, I encourage you to check out my game studio. Um, we make games about mental health, social interaction, and relationship building. Um, and here's some links. Uh, feel free to engage with the q and I'll answer as many questions as I can. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe. Be as healthy as you can in these crazy times. And I hope the rest of 2020 is good to you.